Hello and welcome to the last webinar in 2022. My name is Anna Maria Giraldi. I'm the past president of the International Society for Sexual Medicine. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you to the webinar on female sexuality, an important concept. The webinar is developed in honor of our colleague Ellen Lan, who sadly passed away recently. Persicia will talk a little bit more about that later in her presentation. The ISSM has a vision that every human being has a right to a healthy and satisfying sexual life. Our society was established in 1982 and deals with the whole field of human sexuality. And our mission is to be the most respected and trusted source of information, education and professional development of human sexual health through the delivery of world-class publications, research findings, online and in-person opportunities for knowledge exchange worldwide. And the webinars is a part of this mission and vision. As you can see, we have regional societies throughout the world. We have regional societies in North America, Latin and South America, Europe, the Middle East, the South Asian region, the Asian Pacific region. And we also affiliated with the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. The society owns four journals. We have the Journal of Sexual Medicine, Sexual Medicine Open Access, Sexual Medicine Reviews, and also the Video Journal of Prosthetic Urology and Sexual Medicine. So if you're not already a member, you could consider to become a member to get one of the large benefits to get access to all these journals. And then we have the webinars. I'm so proud of what we have done with our webinars throughout more than two years now. And here you can see some of the examples of the webinars we have had. So if you haven't already watched them, you can go online on the ISSM webpage and find the webinars you're interested in and see them. The webinars have attracted a lot of members. These are the yellow bars, but you can see that we have also reached out to non-members. So we have really managed to attract people watching webinars about sexual health, sexual dysfunction, sexual education, and many important topics on sexual medicine also outside our field uh, and also outside our membership. And you can see here that um, on your right, you can see how many people that have watched the webinars after the webinars have been there. So they have been on the website watching the webinars and you can see the first webinar we had in June, 2020, we had 350 people attending live, but afterwards almost 700 people watched the webinars online. And a webinar like the one in August where we talked about low desire in women was watched live by 200 people, but almost 1,500 people have watched it afterwards. So again, if you haven't seen some of the webinars and are interested, you can find them on our webpage. The webinars have the last two and a half year been organized by the Education Committee of the ISSM. So I want to express my, my sincere gratitude and thank you to the Education Committee for planning these webinars. And I really want to express a sincere gratitude and thank you, especially to Patricia Pasquale, who has been the webinar director. As you can see, Patricia is involved in many, many different activities. She's a clinical psychologist and psychotherapist. She's a sex researcher and an assistant professor at the University in Lisbon. She is the vice chair of the education committee right now, but she will step down from this position. And she's also the president of the Portuguese Society of Clinical Sexology. She's a deputy editor in chief for the Sexual Medicine Open Access Journal. And she's also a member of the advisory board of the World Association for Sexual Health, where she integrates the scientific committee and is vice chair of the World Sexual Health Day Committee. So as you can see, she's a very, very busy woman. And Patricia, I really want to thank you for the huge effort you have done and all the work you have put into establishing and planning these webinars. They have been nothing without you. So I'm sad to tell that Patricia is stepping down, but we will have a new education committee and a new chair for the webinars. But a sincere thank you to you, Patricia, for all the work you have done with the webinars. And by this, I would like to hand over the floor to Patricia, who will tell you about the program today and who is going to speak on the program. Thank you very, very much, Patricia, and thank you everyone for joining these webinars. 
Uh, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Those were really kind, warm words from Ana Maria Giraldi, who herself made an amazing work as president of the International Society of Sexual Medicine. Um, I cannot go on without acknowledging the amazing work developed by the Education Committee that includes Aladdin Trust, of course, but also all our colleagues. And let me tell you that this was always a collaborative um, task. Everybody was really involved giving input. So the education community was amazing. Thank you all. I cannot name everybody now, but people can check their names. They were amazing. And let me just also tell you, also tried very hard to give a taste of dif different sensibilities towards sexual medicine in this webinar. So we want to thank all the people who participated as speakers, as moderators, and also those who ended up not participating, but really struggled to make their agendas meet and be part of this series. Thank you all. It was really, really good. And um, now, uh, contextualizing this webinar in particular, um, I just wanted to highlight that most sex research and clinical sex research has focused on cis women people who were assigned as um, having a woman's gender at birth and who live you know, with that role and are comfortable with that role as women who is aligned with their, the appearance of their genitals. And, and even though we acknowledge that interest in gender identity and gender expression has moved from a strictly binary point of view to embrace and integrate new fields of research in with our webinar today, we will mainly focus on the research and knowledge developed with cis women. This webinar is inspired by Ellen Lan, as Anna Maria already told you. Ellen Lan passed away last January, but she's still an inspiration for a lot of people, not only because of the work she has developed concerning women's sexuality and cis women's sexuality mainly, but also because Ellen Lan is a role model of a very hardworking, strict, very, very demanding person with, them, with herself and with others because she always wanted to make the best. And she was an advocate for for people's rights and evidence-based practice. Ellen did not only make experimental research or lab research, her fields, her actions were much more beyond all that. Ellen also developed survey research, um, research uh, inspired by qualitative research. She was very active in developing clinical research interventions. So she is in fact a role model for what a sex researcher can be in the sense that she integrates basic research, say, say, uh, survey research, sorry, a correlational research with clinical meaningful outputs that um, want to make every everybody's lives better, wants to have that the, give people the chance to have a better sexual life. In this sense, we decided the education committee to, to, to dedicate this uh, webinar to Ellen because some of the people in the education committee, not all, suggested that she was an inspiration in different fields, not only psychology or sexual medicine in a strict sense, but also in other fields. So thank you, Ellen, for all you have done for us. It's not stopping here, your work continues. And so I want to thank everybody for their patience, for their patience and just explain you the setup of the program as we will have the first the presentations and afterwards we have a question and answer session of about 30 minutes, maybe a bit less, maybe a bit more. With the, I think we, you participants who are motivated and want to make questions, please do it through the question and answers button. And please indicate to whom your question is addressed. I will be managing the questions and answers, and I will try to make sure that, you know, there are not a lot of redundant questions and there is a balance in between the diversity of topics that people can address. So I hope I was clear, and I'm now very proud and happy to introduce Laurie Broto. Lori Broto is a professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of the University of British Columbia, where she holds a Canada Research Chair in Women's Sexual Health. She's also the Executive Director of the Women's Sexual Health Research Institute. 
He's especially interested in equity, equity issues and, as such, has increasingly focused on digital health technologies to ensure that more women have access to treatments. Today, Laurie is going to talk about the contextual and gendered nature of sexual problems. Welcome and thank you so much for being here, Laurie. Thank you so much, uh, Patricia, and it's truly an honor for me to be speaking with you all here today. Um, and as Patricia mentioned during the opening remarks, um, Ellen Lan's legacy of her writing, her speaking, her, her teaching, her thinking continue to remain with all of us, with me, as I was thinking about the remarks I wanted to put together. Um, and uh, I would periodically pause while I was putting these slides together and um, I have a little button that uh, Mario gave me that's on my wall and it says you know what would what would Ellen say so with that in mind I'm going to focus um, my brief talk on the gendered nature of sexual desire next so sexual desire is really an elusive and complex and misunderstood topic um, sometimes it can be very exhilarating it can be our life force it can also be frustrating at the same time it can be the source of bliss um, and euphoria but also the source of relationship conflict and relationship demise so sexual desire which we can define maybe, maybe very succinctly as um, an interest in sex, but we can also define it very broadly and, and quite vaguely and quite differently depending on um, what interests us as sex researchers and also um, our own particular theoretical background. So we use different terms like libido, drive, lust, desire, horniness, and we use all of these interchangeably. Sometimes words like randy and sensual may be interpreted as positive euphemisms for desire, whereas other terms like lechery and lasciviousness are quite pejorative. So to some people, these are all ter these terms are all different sides of the same desire coin, whereas to others, each of these terms convey something quite different, maybe tapping into different motivational versus cognitive versus biological or maybe even spiritual aspects of sexual desire. So for my brief presentation today, I really want to focus on how we're defining desire. And then I want to turn to uh, one of the very recent review papers that was authored by um, the late Ellen Lan and her colleague Anders Agmo to help us think about how do we move forward from some of the very kind of gendered approaches towards sexual desire towards a more unified theory that will help guide our research and treatment. Next. So when we look at the prevalence of uh, sexual problems, there have been many excellent large scale comprehensive surveys that has that have been done. Um, the NATSAL or the National Survey of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles. Um, uh, the, the fourth edition is uh, the, the data are well underway, but the latest we have are from the third wave of NATSAL. And this essentially surveyed 15,000 UK residents across a wide vast of uh, uh, a vast array of ages. Next slide. And when we look at the prevalence of sexual concerns, first of all, there's a couple of big take home messages I want you to take from this slide. Lack of interest in sex or low desire is the most common of the sexual concerns, not just in women, but also in men. And this is really interesting because so often um, in men or in males, we focus much more on erectile function. And yet the large surveys quite consistently indicate that low desire across ages tends to be the most common of their sexual difficulties. Next slide. Um, but un unfortunately, what we have seen is uh, a very gendered understanding of sexual desire. So, uh, for example, when we look at the diagnoses and the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, it is at present gender segregated. We have hypoactive sexual desire disorder in men, sexual interest arousal disorder in women. In our writing, we tend to write about men's desire as being spontaneous, as occurring out of the blue, whereas women's desire being much more likely to be responsive or um, sensitive to sexual triggers. 
our research and also our, our thinking and even just discussing of sexual desire has also been very gendered in terms of underlying etiology. And often we talk about men's desire having more biological roots and women's desire having more interpersonal or psychological roots. So this has resulted in quite different approaches to research and also knowledge about how do we effectively manage this most common sexual difficulty. Um, and these quite gendered approaches, I would argue, have really stagnated our research and also our clinical management of low desire. So very recently, as I mentioned, there has been an excellent review paper in the annual review of sex research authored uh, by our beloved Ellen Lan um, and, and co-author Anders Agmo. Um, and in that paper, they state, and I quote, one of the most important reasons for the difficulties in finding efficient treatments of sexual desire disorders is a deficient analysis of the concept of sexual desire. So I thought it would be interesting for us to sort of go back in time a little bit and look at how historically other giants in our field have defined sexual desire and how can that position us to um, conceptualize a more gender neutral uh, way of understanding desire. Next slide. So let's start with Ellen Kaplan. And in her 1979 book, Disorders of Desire, Volume 2, there she defines sexual desire as an appetite or drive, which is produced by the activation of a specific neural system in the brain, while the excitement and orgasm phases involve the genital organs. So Kaplan goes on to say, sexual desire or libido um, it is experienced as a specific sensation which moves the individual to seek out or become receptive. To sexual experiences. These sensations are produced by the physical activation of a specific neural system in the brain. And then when this system is active, a person is horny. Those were her words, not mine. Um, he or she may feel genital sensations, or he or she may feel vaguely sexy, interested in sex, open to sex, or even just restless. These sensations cease after sexual gratification is reached. I think this is actually quite a good definition and one that we don't often recall in uh, our more contemporary research uh, and treatment of sexual desire. And what I like about it is that it emphasizes the dual control nature um, with desire having both inhibitory and facilitatory centers. It has extensive connections with other parts of the brain and body that drive us to be influenced by and, and also integrated into the individual individual's total life experience. Um, next slide. Some years later, Levine, uh, Steve Levine expanded on this definition, again in a gender neutral way, and wrote, sexual desire is the psychobiologic energy that precedes and accompanies arousal and tends to produce sexual behavior, emphasis on tends to because it doesn't always. And different from Kaplan, Levine acknowledges that it accompanies arousal, desire and arousal occurring uh, at the same time. But his definition emphasizes um, that it also precedes behavior. And he calls it an energy, which I think is interesting and has not um, gotten that much attention in our research over time. Next slide. Some years later, Regan and Bersheed carried out quite an elegant series of qualitative studies that have aimed to explore the lived experience of sexual desire. And they offered this definition, which also does not get cited very often, but I think is actually quite good. A psychological state subjectively experienced by the individual as an awareness that he or she wants or wishes to attain a presumably pleasurable sexual goal that's currently unattainable. Um, next slide. So Levine, a few years later, added to his previous definition, recognizing the multiplicity of factors that push us and pull us towards and away from desire. And his elaboration went on to say, sexual desire is the sum of forces that inclines us towards and away from sexual behavior. And it has biological underpinnings that involve the cerebral cortex, the limbic system, and the endocrine system. So until this point, so until about 2002, much of the, the writing about sexual desire was not gendered. 
Um, but then in the kind of mid 2000s, we really started to see a shift in this gendered um, disaggregation of our understanding of sexual desire that probably coincided with much of the pharmaceutical interest in finding treatments for erectile dysfunction in men and sexual problems in women. And so with that next slide, we have this brilliant article, um, brilliant though gendered article by uh, Marta Miana who wrote about women's desire. Um, and she says, she, she doesn't define desire, but instead she posed a number of critical questions to help us think about the construct of desire in a way that might move the field closer. And she recognized that as the most subjective and acutely amorphous part of sexuality, it's hardly surprising that desire was totally bypassed by Masters and Johnson in their quest to operationalize sexual response. But she asked some pretty provocative questions that remain with us today, namely, um, what if being desired and desiring are turn ons for women in and of themselves without any necessary action? In other words, if we could disentangle interest from actual behavior. And if we conceptualize desire as a goal driven state with having sex as the endpoint, we actually might be overlooking the fundamental nature of desire. So I might ask, although this beautiful art article fits so well for understanding women's desire, could it not also fit for understanding men's desire? Next slide. So after that point, again, we saw a, a, a quite a uh, a segregation or a disaggregation, a gendered approach with most of the research addressing treatments for women have focused on many psychological approaches, but also hormonal and pharmaceutical. And whereas in men, nearly all of the treatments for men's desire have focused on hormonal and pharmaceutical. And I can probably count on one hand the number of treatments that have evaluated psychological interventions for men's desire. Next, is, uh, next slide. And maybe it's because Kaplan was right when she said uh, back in 1979 that uh, compared with the excitement or orgasmic disorders, desire is the hardest to treat. Next slide. So we may have been at a cross. Actually, let's forward one more slide after that. So back to the paper that I encourage all of us to read. Um, this is a, a, a kind of a reinterpretation of the incentive motivation model by Totes, published in 2009 and with Singer and Totes shortly thereafter. And Alan Lan and Anders Egmo really highlight the importance of focusing on the incentive stimulus, those both external as well as internal sexually relevant, sexually competent cues that elicit an interest in sexual, uh, in sexual motivation or sexual activity. They argue that mental representation of these triggers can be equally efficient as external ones. And this is really important because we've rarely acknowledged these in the case of women's sexual desire. We often talk about men's, men's fantasies as eliciting um, interest and motivation, but rarely do we talk about this in the case of women. They also highlight and remind us that there's a visceral somatic response, clitoral engorgement, and vaginal lubrication in females, and penile erection in males, um, and that this can occur without any conscious evaluation of that stimulus. So although we often talk about women's having this disconnect between an awareness of their body and their mental arousal, this can also be a feature of men's sexual response as well. So the implications of this model from a gender neutral or gender inclusive, I would argue, perspective is that apart from severe, um, sorry, the implications of this is that the cognitive evaluation of the incentive stimulus concludes that the stimulus has no sexual rewards or that it might have an aversive consequence. And this means that central motive state doesn't get activated. And this is important for both men and for women. This model can also be very helpful for helping us understand where breaks in the cycle might occur. And another break might be when that central motive state is activated, but there's a conscious decision not to engage, maybe for safety reasons, for consent reasons, and that this also applies to men and women. So if we adopt this model, 
what new research questions can this lead us to in the next generation that might help us have a more inclusive gender uh, gender inclusive um, uh, approach to understanding sexual desire. So some of the research questions that this leads to are, what are the types of external as well as internal sexual stimuli that activate sexual motivation? We need much more research to understand what those cues are and whether or not they are indeed gendered. We also need much more information on the factors that impact how a sexual incentive is perceived, the cognitive, the emotional, and the biological factors. Is there a gendered aspect to the threshold for converting activation of the central mode of state to action or behavior? There's been lots of speculation about men being more sensitive to sexual cues, but I've yet to be convinced of actual data that show us that those gender differences hold. How do the emotional outcomes after a sexual encounter impact the strength of those cues in the next sexual encounter? And is this gendered? So much more research is needed on the rewarding and emotional aspects of a sexual encounter in driving future uh, motivation for sex. How can treatments positively impact those emotional outcomes? And finally, is there a gendered aspect to the conscious decision, the giving of consent, um, and the decision not to engage in sex even after that central mode of state is activated? So my last slide, um, in conclusion, um, the take home message is number one, please go and read that article <laughs> start to finish. The incentive motivation model is extremely useful for helping us understand motivation and desire, how outcomes impact behavior. We really need more research that takes a gender inclusive approach in men, women and gender diverse people to really understand how those incentives translate into motivation for sex. And I would argue as did um, uh, Lan and, and Agmo in this paper, that a single unifying theory can account for sexual desire in men and women and gender diverse people and really needs uh, to be further studied. So thank you very much for your attention and your time today. And again, highly recommend this article to all of you. Thank you so much, Laurie. That was a very impressive talk that, you know, how could you fit everything? You are amazing too. How could you fit conceptual issues, theoretical issues, a review, and still a call for diversity and inclusive practices? Thank you so much. Um, I hope there are some questions, um, you know, aimed at you. But first, let's have a look at what Marlene Werner has to tell us. I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly, Marlene. So Marlene is a PhD student and researcher in training, and she graduated as a master's of clinical psychology and psychological methods at the University of Amsterdam, where she started to assist the late Ellen Lan with her research. Today, Marlene will give us a peek behind the scenes of her, her PhD project to show us why female sexuality is an important but sometimes overstated concept, a notion she learned from her late promoter. So Marlene, take the chance to talk about sexual problems and reduced quality of life after gonadotoxic toxic uh, uh, interventions. I hope you can say it better than I do. What do male sex hormones got to do with it? So thank you, Marlene, and take the lead now. Thank you so much, Patricia, for this lovely introduction. Gonna share my slides. Yes, hello all of you around the world. Um, before I begin with my talk, I want to thank the ISSM webinar team for having me. I feel very touched that they invited me to present uh, and to share wisdom with you that I learned from my late supervisor, Ellen Lan. And I'm also honored and quite nervous to do so in the company of scientists to whom I look up to very much. Uh, you already heard her talk, Dr. Brodo, Dr. Giraldi, and of course, Dr. Pasquel. Uh, today, I will give you a peek behind the scenes of my PhD project for which Ellen Lan suggested the overall topic in 2019. We were able to work together on the project until late 2021, and I continue to work on the project, but of course, sadly, without her. But with the support of my supervisory and research expert team in the Amsterdam UMC. To give you uh, some context, 
in the PhD project, we study cis women's sexual and general well-being after gonadotoxic interventions. And we study specifically the role that the ovaries and that testosterone play in cis women's sexual and general well-being. The whole project comprises different studies, but the kind of flagship project is called TOSCA, which is short for treatment-induced ovarian insufficiency and sexual problems after cancer therapy. In this observational study, we researched cis women after Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and we relate the gonadotoxicity of the treatment that they received as a quasi-experimental predictor to differences in testosterone concentration, and we then relate the differences in testosterone concentration to potential differences in sexual and general well-being that these cis women might experience. However, today I will not get into the scientific details of the PhD project, but I will discuss the conceptual basis on which the PhD project rests. And I will do so by presenting different pieces of wisdom that I was lucky enough to learn directly and indirectly from Ellen Lan. These uh, pieces of wisdom together will answer the question why we studied testosterone's role rather than estrogens, in cis women's rather than cis men's, sexual rather than reproductive, well-being rather than only sexual function, and do so specifically in a group of women who have received differently gonadotoxic treatments against Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, these pieces of wisdom are threefold. They're also today's take-home messages. You can see them here, and I will discuss them in order. Meanwhile, I hope to give one possible answer to the question of today's webinar, whether female sexuality is an important concept. I understood the question such that it asks, on the one hand, whether female sexuality is an important concept, as distinct from, for instance, male sexuality, and on the other, whether female sexuality is, a diff is an important concept as compared to, for instance, female reproduction. And in the spirit of Ellen Lan, I hope to convince you today that female sexuality might not be an important concept because it's not essentially different from male sexuality in many aspects, but that it is an important concept in that female sexuality is different from female reproduction in many aspects, and that thinking otherwise might misguide us more than it helps us in understanding human sexuality. So regarding that first nugget of wisdom, namely the differences in averages between groups, which in our case are cis men and cis women, do not necessarily imply that the characteristics on which you find a difference therefore also play a different role in the groups in which you find the difference. In the context of my PhD project, this is exemplified as follows. Of course, there are differences between cis men and cis women in the absolute concentration levels of total testosterone, which are shown here on a log scale. But just because you find these differences between cis men and cis women, this does not mean that the, that testosterone therefore also plays a differential role in female and male sexual and general well-being. For the data geeks among us, I exemplify this with, uh, as a disclaimer, simulated data in this full graph. Just because the two groups differ on average on two characteristics, this does not mean that the relationships between these two characteristics have to be different. Both of these relationships can be 0.3, as you can see here, even though the simulated averages of both variables differ between the groups. And for the clinicians among us, I list the summarized symptom domains of the so-called female androgen insufficiency syndrome and adult onset or functional hypogonadism here. These look like twins, don't they? And I would suggest that this is because testosterone insufficiency might occur at different testosterone levels for cis men and cis women, but that such insufficiency then acts similarly in cis men and cis women and maybe all humans. Um, however, note that uh, hypogonadism is medically recognized in the ICD and female androgen insufficiency is not. 
partially, of course, for good reasons, because hypogonadism finally has commonly accepted biochemical criteria, and FISE does not yet. The state of affairs is unfortunate also because the diagnostic definition of those two syndromes differs in other ways. I mean, maybe that's my limited psychologist mind speaking, but what I still do not understand is why we consider the underperforming testicle a reproductive and sexual issue, but we understand the underperforming ovary, the etiological twin of hypogonadism, namely primary ovarian insufficiency, why we consider that mostly in terms of the reproductive, but not the sexual function of the ovary. And why does the ICD recognize the more reproductive problem poi, but not the more sexual problem phys? Of course, clear biochemical criteria are very important for medical recognition. And it might even be helpful that um, phys is considered uh, etiologically more broadly than just due to ovarian insufficiency. However, I think that the differences in labeling uh, in definition and in recognition of these syndromes can lead us to overlook the role of the ovary in sexual dysfunction and the role of sexual dysfunction in ovarian dysfunction. Which brings me to the next nugget of wisdom, namely that we should not equate the sexual function of the ovary with its reproductive function. Regarding the topic of my PhD project, ignoring the sexual role of the ovary seems to translate into two misconceptions. First, thinking that the postmenopausal ovary is disposable because it does not have a reproductive function anymore. And second, ignoring the sexual repercussions of primary ovarian insufficiency. Of course, the postmenopausal ovary is not reproductively active anymore because it's depleted of oocytes. A postmenopausal woman therefore also does not experience um, the hormonal cycles anymore that are associated with the cyclical uh, ripening of egg cells. However, I would argue that the natural menopause, so the cessation of the reproductive function of the ovary and the hormonal cycles, is not the same as a sexual pause, and that the postmenopausal ovary ceases to be a sexual organ. Even though there is disagreement about this in the literature, which I try to indicate here with this little star, um, there is quite some evidence that the intact stroma of the ovary and also that of the postmenopausal one produces testosterone. Because on the one hand, it does seem possible that a lowered uh, ovarian androgen output could be compensated for by an intact adrenal cortex and DHEA, uh, which is a precursor to testosterone. It's quite uh, possible that the ovaries still seem to be an important and probably also crucial contributor to overall androgen levels, and that this is also the case for postmenopausal women, uh, and especially if they have an intact adrenal cortis. Because, for instance, um, Jans et al. and Soma et, Soman et al. have shown that match controls show higher testosterone levels than women with either spontaneous or iatrogenic poi. And Stancic and others have shown that um, Oh, I'm sorry, that um, ophorectomy leads to a similar decrease of serum testosterone in postmenopausal women compared to premenopausal women. And finally, Vogel et al. have shown that there are measurable quantities of testosterone to be found in ovarian bloods of ovarian venous blood samples in postmenopausal women. And all of these women, these studied women, had functioning adrenal cortices. However, you might ask, what is the role of testosterone in sexual function then? Because you seem to equate the testosterone output of the ovary with its sexual role. I do so because we know from very different strands of studies, especially experimental evidence, that testosterone plays a role in the sexual well-being of mammals and humans. And while estrogen and testosterone together create important preconditions for a functional vaginal and vulval, so genital response, uh, testosterone might be particularly important for more centrally mediated sexual responses, such as sexual desire and sexual pleasure. And this has clinical relevance because it might explain why women who undergo a risk-reducing salpingo because of a BRCA gene mutation, 
report that removal of the ovaries affects sexual function negatively. And this, that this um, negative effect does not seem to be sufficiently reversed by estrogen hormone therapy. And then at least I find it laudable, but limited, that fertility consequences of gonadotoxic treatments in premenopausal women are discussed, but sexual repercussions of those treatments are discussed a lot less. Which brings me to the last nugget of wisdom, namely that measurement and modeling matters. Because why is it that despite the evidence I've just presented, we often cannot find robust relationships between differences in testosterone concentrations between cis men as cis women and differences in sexuality related outcomes between cis, between cis women, even in well-conducted and adequately powered correlational studies. What Ellen would say is that we have often not measured testosterone and the sexual, sexuality related outcomes that vary with testosterone in a valid manner and that we should study the relationship between testosterone and the adequate outcome measures in a group of cis women who are comparable in all kinds of aspects, but differ in having insufficient to sufficient testosterone levels. Why is that? First, the endocrinologists among you might know, but it's quite difficult to measure steroid hormones well, especially in cis women. 20 years ago, Herold et al. noted that a testosterone measurement in cis women is not better than a guess. Uh, however, current methods have uh, fortunately largely improved. And uh, for instance, in cis men, testosterone reference ranges have been harmonized. And these developments hopefully um, allow us to pick up the differences in testosterone uh, among cis women and in cis women um, in a more fine-grained matter, manner. And this allows us to then relate those testosterone differences to differences in various outcome measures. And as for measuring sexuality-related outcomes, as um, John Bancroft and Julian Davidson have suggested already 30 years ago, we might need to research sexual arousability and sexual pleasure rather than sexual function to find consistent relationships with testosterone. And arousability and pleasure are often not part of our measurements and operationalizations of sexual function. And as you can see here from a very quick PubMed search, uh, sexual function and uh, sexual pleasure and sexual arousability were not studied as frequently as sexual function in combination with testosterone. And second, as we might wish, but no, not to be true, life is not linear. And sometimes it's okay to make that simplifying assumption, but in many cases, it really doesn't dovetail with reality. And regarding the PhD project, this means that we actually do not expect uh, the relationship between testosterone and uh, what we measure sexual arousability to be linear, but nonlinear across insufficient to sufficient testosterone levels, which you can see here. Again, I show this with uh, simulated data. And this is also why we um, actually sample among insufficient to sufficient testosterone levels in uh, cis women, because we expect to find a more consistent relationship between testosterone and sexual ex experiences across the insufficient to sufficient testosterone levels because the residual differences within these groups might have to do with a myriad of other factors rather than testosterone levels, such as, as Ellen would have said, the opportunities rather than the capacity to have arousing and pleasurable sex. So why do we study testosterones rather than estrogens, role in cis women's rather than cis men's, sexual rather than reproductive, well-being rather than only sexual function, and do so specifically in a sample of cis women who have undergone treatments that differ in gonadotoxicity. Ellen would say first, because even though cis women and cis men differ in absolute testosterone levels, testosterone is similarly important to female and male sexuality. And hypogonadism and phys might be of the same species called human testosterone insufficiency or human hypogonadism. Note that such a label would also include non-binary folks with ovaries and trans women. And my colleague, Anor Giles, is studying the role of testosterone in trans women's sexual well-being. Second, 
because the reproductive function of the ovary is not equivalent to its sexual function. The postmenopausal, non-reproductively active ovary is not a dead organ, as it appears to remain a hormone-producing and specifically testosterone-producing gland with a role in sexual and general well-being. Third, because when studying the relationship between testosterone and uh, sexual outcome measures, measurement and modeling might really matter. The reason why we found inconsistent relationships between the two so far might have to do with the fact that we used the wrong measurement instruments, the wrong data analytic techniques, and looked in the wrong populations. I hope you now see why I, in the spirit of Ellen Lan, suggested that female sexuality is an overstated and at the same time underrated concept. Men and women, as humans, can be more alike than different when we look at their sexual machinery. And for humans, pleasurable sexuality is an important concept, which is related to, but distinct from reproduction. I assume Ellen would conclude by saying that we should not focus on the differences between female and male sexuality, and we should not prioritize reproductive issues over sexual ones because we should remember that sex is not the same as heterosexual, heterosexual couples making babies, but that sex is pleasure shared affectionately among equals, and that we should focus on making that a possibility for our human patients, regardless of their sex and gender. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marlene. Um, for your very dedicated and accurate presentation and for reminding us that having the capacity doesn't always mean the opportunities are out there and with less capacity and good opportunities things might balance anyway. So let's work on the things we can, namely on the equal opportunities for all human beings. Okay, thank you. I hope there are some questions for Marlene too. I have some already, but meanwhile, let's hear Anna Maria Giraldi, um, who I would like to start by thanking all the support she has given the Education Committee and the webinars. Uh, and Anna Maria, it has been a pleasure to work under your guidance. You are an amazing person. Anna Maria is the past president of the International Society for Sexual Medicine and is a senior consultant in psychiatry in the sexual, Sexological Clinic at Psychiatric Center Copenhagen. And she's a professor of clinical sexology at the University of Copenhagen, Denmark, where she also received her medical degree and her PhD. Professor Giraldi has been involved in the field of sexual medicine for many, many years, educating all kinds of students from the medical field, nurses, physicians, etc. And she has been a devoted uh, contributor to the Society of Sexual Medicine, namely the European and the International Society. For example, Professor Giraldi was previously the deputy editor of the Journal of Sexual Medicine, and she has served also as an associate editor for Sexual Medicine. In open, uh, open access. She was the president of both Scandinavian Society for Sexual Medicine and the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, where she also has served on the board and scientific committee. In addition, she was the chair of the subcommittee on female sexual health for the European Society for Sexual Medicine. Today, Anna Maria Giraldi is going to present on psychophysiology research and clinical practice. So let's hear what Anna Maria has also to say to us. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to give my talk psychophysiology research and clinical practice. So what I would like to cover in my talk is listed here. I just want to address what is psychophysiology? Why is it relevant for sexual health? And I will focus on arousal and pain responses. And finally, I'll some, add some comments to what is the clinical relevance and how can we work with this in the clinical practice? So what is psychophysiology and why is it interesting? I think it's interesting because sometimes in sexual medicine, we actually forget that the body and mind are connected. So psychophysiology can be described as the relationship by, between the physiological signals recorded from the body and brain to mental processes and disorders. 
And the psychophysiological disorder is characterized by a physical symptom that are partly induced by emotional factors. So psychophysiology is actually the interaction between what's happening in the body and what's happening in the mind. So you can describe it that we have this continuous interaction between the body and the mind. And the body here can be the genitals and then we have the brain. And stimuli to the brain will of course send signals to the genitals and genitals will also send signals to the brain. And some examples can, for example, be erectile dysfunction in men, where a man will experience that he has a decrease in his erection. Then it will send signals to the brain that something is wrong, and the brain will send signals back to the genitals saying that something is wrong, and that will increase his erectile function, dysfunction. We also see it in women with vaginismus, where the fear for penetration will send signals to the pelvic floor that will contract it will then hurt that send signals back to the brain that something is wrong. And then we have this vicious circle. And you will also see that in sexual pain, which I will describe later. So we just have to see that we have this constant interaction between the body and the brain. Some of the studies that have looked at arousal are now today common knowledge and common methods. But only some years ago, these were really new and were conducted by, for example, Ellen Lance Group. So just to give you some examples, when we talk about arousal in women, we can most, both measure the objective arousal and the subjective arousal. The objective arousal you can see on the left is measured by a vaginal photoplethysmograph, which is a tampon-like um, tracer which you add into the uh, vagina and here it will measure how much blood will be running to the genitals and that's an indicator of the genital arousal there will be an increase in the amplitude and in the blood volume when the women get sexually aroused at the same time the women can measure their subjective arousal meaning how aroused do they actually feel during the stimuli and they can do that just after or under the sexual stimulation some of the first and very pivotal studies were done by Ella Land's group. And here you can see one study, which is assessing female sexual arousal. And they are assessing both the subjective and the objective arousal in women receiving different stimuli. So these women, 49 young premenopausal women, had neutral stimuli. They had anxiety provoking stimuli. They had sexual threat stimuli. And then they had sexual stimuli, erotic stimuli. And if we look at their emotional responses here at your left, you can see that the emotional responses followed very well the stimuli. So if they had sexual stimuli, they had the strongest sexual arousal. If they had anxiety provoking stimuli, they had a lot of anxiety emotional responses. And also if they had sexual threat stimuli, they had anxiety. So this tells us that depending on the stimuli, the women will have different emotional responses. What they also for, so, saw was that depending on the different stimuli, there were different responses in the genitals. If the women had neutral or anxiety provoking stimuli, you can see here that they had um, no changes in the amplitude, but there was actually a negative blood flow to the vagina when the women had anxiety stimulating stimuli. When the women had sexual threat stimuli, there was a small but not very large increase in the blood flow to the genitals. But when they had erotic stimuli that were truly sexual stimuli, there was a huge increase in the vaginal blood flow, indicating that they would lubricate more uh, during this stimuli. So this tells us that if women have sexual threat or anxiety provoking stimuli, they will have a decrease in the blood flow to the vagina and also the emotional response that is negative. A group that has investigated the correlation between the subjective and the objective arousal in both men and women is the group from Meredith Chivers. I'm going to share some of the results. So what they did was that they took in this example, heterosexual men and women, they gave them sexual uh, stimuli and then they looked at how was the objective and how was the subjective uh, arousal responses in both men and women. They looked at whether they would correlate. So would the objective and subjective arousal response correlate and would they be aroused by uh, what they thought they would be aroused 
by. So what they did was that they measured both the uh, objective and subjective arousals and they gave like increased levels of sexual stimuli to these heterosexual men and women. So they showed nude men and women exercising, masturbating, having sex with each other, women having sex with women, men having sex with men, and a heterosexual couple having sex. And then they had a neutral stimulation as a baseline. So what they found was first here, I'm going to show you the men. So what they found here was that with increased sexual stimuli, exercising, masturbating, uh, or copulating with males or females, the men would have almost no genital response when they saw men, but when they watched women or heterosexual couple, the genitals would respond, meaning they had an erection and they had no effect when they had the neutral stimulation. And also when the men graded their arousal, they saw the same pattern. They said they were not subjectively aroused by seeing other men. They were subjectively aroused by seeing women and men and women having sex with each other. So the interpretation is that the men would react on what they said they would because they said they were heterosexual. So they would react on sexual situations, including females, but not males. And there was a good correlation between the objective, the genital arousal and the subjective arousal in these men. When they looked at women, the pattern was quite different. As you can see, most of the more explicit sexual uh, situations, whether they included females or males or men and women, would increase the genital blood flow to women, meaning that the objective arousal was increased in these different sexual uh, situations, no matter whether it was men or women they watched. And also, when they asked the women, they found that they said, no, we are not so aroused by watching females or not even males alone, but we are more aroused watching the heterosexual couples. So this tells us that the women's genitals were reacting on most sexual situations and there was not a very uh, good correlation between the objective and the subjective arousal as the women would mainly say they were subjectively aroused of women having sex with men. So this difference between men and women in these studies have been discussed a lot. But one of the conclusions we can make is that maybe for some women, there's not a very good correlation what's happening in the genitals and what's happening in the mind. One very interesting study that investigated the correlation between subjective and genital arousal, indicating that the feeling of arousal is maybe more influenced by the, my, by, by the mind than the genitals, is a small study also done by Ella Lanz group. In this study, they included 12 premenopausal women that had no sexual dysfunction, and they gave them 50 milligram of sildenafil or placebo, and then they measured the vaginal blood flow and their subjective arousal responses. And as you can see here, when they measured the blood flow to the vagina, if the women had no sexual stimulation, there was a small increase in blood flow in women receiving sildenafil, that's the black bars compared to placebo, which are the white bars. And then they had increased sexual stimuli, there was an increase in vaginal blood flow, and it was significantly, significantly enhanced in women receiving sildenafil, which is what we expected. But the very interesting uh, results in this study is that when they asked the women how sexually aroused they felt, the subjective sexual arousal, and how wet they felt their vaginas were, this was influenced by whether they felt they had received placebo or sildenafil. So in women that suspected they had uh, received placebo, there was a lower increase in subjective sexual arousal than in the women that suspected they had sildenafil, and it was not influenced whether they had actually received it or not. And the same was the case for how wet they felt in the vagina, that if they suspected they had received placebo, it was much lower than if they suspected they had received sildenafil, and there was no differences between what they actually received. So this really tells us that maybe the response and the subjective arousal is more depending on what's happening in the mind than what's actually happening in the genitals. But we have said to say that these women were non-dysfunctional women. Another area, as I mentioned in the beginning, where there's a very large interaction between the body and the mind is the sexual pain responses. 
And this is illustrated by a model here by Rosemary Besson's group, where she is describing how women, as you can see on your right, have a chronic uh, pain syndrome, either in the bladder or in the genitals, and that might induce ongoing changes to the brain pain circuits away from sensory areas to areas involved in emotion and motivations. And that also might alter the cognitive processes, so the response to sexual cues is altered. That will result in a loss of sexual motivation and desire arousal because the women will feel this pain and they will be stressed of the pain and might even feel sexually substandard and they will also have emotional distress and that might induce neuroendocrine changes in the skin and they will have a hypersensitivity to the pain signals and there might also be a central sensitization in the brain and the spinal cord. That might lead to what she describes here in the middle, fear and avoidance. And that is what is also described on the next level of this model, that the pain will induce fear of pain in the women. So even before they feel the pain, they will actually fear the pain, which is the emotional response. And that will actually result in less attention to processes that are sexually arousing. And that means that they will lose their lubrication, they will have a heightened tone of the pelvic floor, and that will increase the pain. And that again will have an influence on their sexual motivation, they will have loss of sexual arousal, uh, the subjective one, and that will increase the stress and emotional distress, and we will have this vicious circle where the signal from the body increases the emotional response, and the emotional response increases the signals from the body. So what is the clinical relevance of all this? I think that we first of all need to be aware and identify that there is a body and mind connection. As I said in the beginning, a lot of women are not aware of this body and mind connection when they present their sexual problems in the clinical setting. So we need to discuss with the women and have attention to what is happening in the body and the mind. We need to help to restructure automatic thoughts and decrease alert and anxiety, meaning we need to work with the mind. We need to increase attention to sexual cues. And also we need to increase what's happening in the body by changing the bodily inputs and investigate and expand on pleasurable inputs so that the inputs from the body are pleasurable and not something that's causing problems. But fortunately, we have many different classical sexological treatments where we deal with this concept of integrating the body and the mind. First of all, it's important that we inform and educate the women how do the body and the mind interact. We can talk to the women about self-exploration, what is pleasurable, what are my reactions, so they get more knowledge on what are bodily sensations that are nice and also how do they react on different stimuli. Sensate focus is really a field where you try this as you focus on pleasurable and non-threatening stimuli so the body and the mind can relax and focus on what is nice. We work with exposures like the use of dilators in a controlled and pleasurable environment for women with pain and vaginistic reactions. Also mindfulness, which has been practiced a lot and studied a lot by Laurie Broder's group, will increase the attention to what is actually happening in the body and finally, you can work with cognitive behavioral therapy that will increase the attention to the connection between the thoughts and the feeling and how is your body reacting. So I think that many of the concepts that we know today about uh, psychophysiology has been developed uh, by uh, the work of Ellen Lan. And I think we can again thank her for all the work she did. And I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to give my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna Maria, for helping us to make it very clear how experimental lab research and clinical research translates into the practice, clinical practice. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a very good review. Uh, we have now the question and answer session opened. Um, and of course, I want to thank all presenters and all attendees for making this a uh, participated session. We have some questions that uh, I've received some questions that are a bit of out of the scope of this um, um, webinar and that are well placed in other webinars. So I'm not going to focus on that one, on those ones. 
Um, okay, I have one question that is, I know Lori has some very narrow minutes, some scarce minutes to stay with us. So um, I have a question that I'm not sure if it's really in line um, with what you presented, but anyway, I'll be forced to a person who actually asks if um, about the, um, the role that um, a stradial level has on uh, explaining male desire, if it is known if extradial level also plays a role in female sexual desire. Um, this is one question. Another one is, um, if you if you think that it's still useful to have used the concept of desire, because we mean, meanwhile have used interest to, and we have this incentive motivational uh, model, and desire has been you know back and forth as such a complex concept with so many people arguing for different approach approaches to it. Is it still a useful concept, Lori? Are we ready? to get rid of desire or we should kind of make an extreme makeover, get rid of the misunderstandings. So um, these two are definitely for you. Thanks, Patricia. Um, yeah, I have to I have to run off and teach in, in a few minutes. Um, so the second question, I mean, you'll recall my very first slide, that sort of word map that essentially asked people, you know, what are words that you would use to describe sexual desire? And uh, you can see that, uh, uh, well, if you go back to the slides, you'll see that actually the largest one, which is the word that's given them the highest rating from people, was lust, right? Lust, which we, I've never seen a publication with lust in the title that pertains to sexual desire. And then the second most common ones were uh, passion and sensual. So I think that what becomes really important and part of the reason why I wanted to go through those historical studies that have defined desire is to acknowledge that we've actually been defining it in, in quite different ways, which means then that when we are asking people in studies how they're defining desire, their conceptualization might be different from ours. Here is where I think mixed methods and qualitative studies provide so much richness. Obviously, validated self-report measures can be really important as quick screening tools, as ways to, to be able to compile a lot of data across studies, but they also very often miss the nuance in how people define desire. So I personally am not ready to throw the word desire out, but I'm very ready to incorporate much more nuance in hearing from our participants um, uh, in how they define desire. And then I think your second question was male desire um, depends on estradiol level in the brain. What about female? Yeah, I mean, here's another place. And I think I mean, Marlene did such a beautiful job in her presentation where we've had this unfortunate gendering of hormone as well, right? Testosterone as being the male hormone, estradiol as being the female hormone. And I think we have so much evidence that indicates that that's not the case, that there is no such thing as a male versus a female hormone, that all of these hormones play important roles in men, women. And we have yet to, again, I want to put a, an important plug for our better study of gender diverse people as well, where this research, perhaps it's been done, but it's certainly not showing up in our publications. And I think it's because when people go to publish their papers, maybe a reviewer, maybe an editor says your sample size for gender diverse people is too small, remove them. So at some point, we're going to need to do better. We need to make sure that we report even on those low, uh, low sample sizes um, for that. So thanks. Thanks for the questions. Okay. Do you have Can time I for just one add more? a comment while Laurie is still here? I, I just want to thank you, Laurie, for, for the presentation and, and, and your always good answer. And I think that the small studies I presented from Ella Lanz group, I mean, they were so small. So maybe we are now where we need to start, as you say, you take out uh, non-conforming people, uh, gender conforming people, uh, but maybe the, the future is now that you include and make small studies to get some ideas and then we develop the research from that. So I think it's quite interesting when you see it over time that we always start with small studies and then, then you move on with larger samples. Um, if you still have time for one question, I have a, a mix of Marlene and myself. So Marlene is saying, in, in what ways can be sexual desire be 
fueled, I mean, receive energy from or be explained by sexual rewards. Um, and in that sense, what I'm adding to Marlene is can somebody has, you know, this, an unsatisfactory or distressful sexual life, can we expect this person to have sexual desire anyway? So I think they kind of build up with each other these two questions. Do you want me to tackle that one, Patricia? Yeah, yeah. I would yeah. love to hear your comments on that. Yeah, we... so so um the the PDF, the paper that I referenced quite heavily in my talk, I included it's open access. There is some really careful thinking about the importance of us studying and understanding rewards on the out on the on the on the outside on the far right hand side of sexual activity, including emotional rewards. And so the question is, you know, if sexual activity is rewarding for other reasons, can that in and of itself be an incentive for future sexual encounters, even in the context of pain, distress, other issues as well? And so, you know, I think I think we have a long way to go in really understanding um, those rewards and how they kind of play into that incentive motivation for future encounters. So, um, yeah, I, I think the answer to your your question is it's complex and probably yes. <laughs> Yeah, so we have to know more about the context, right? Even the genders or other aspects that may contextualize and frame desire. That's good. Thank you, Laurie. I think you need to rush, right? I'm feeling it. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Brodo. Uh, thank you. Okay, so let's move on. We have some questions that are specific for um, Marlene. So uh, I have some problems with medical concepts and how to say it with a proper accent. So I hope I do this one well. So first question is, does risk redux reducing BSO have the same negative impact on sexual function in both premenopausal and postmenopausal women? And um, the same person added up if, uh, um, no, it's just this. I think it's basically this. So I'm texting it to you in case my accent was not good enough, Marlene, okay? Don't worry, Patricia, I fully understand what was said. Um, so uh, as another disclaimer, the risk reducing ovarectomy is not my particularly area of expertise, but the um, evidence that I based this on is a meta-analysis and also some studies that have been done recently in uh, the Netherlands. And what I could gather from that evidence that is that actually there's uh, so that in pre and postmenopausal women, it actually affects sexual function negatively. So it does not depend on the menopausal status of the woman undergoing the bilateral uh, ovarectomy. And that's actually not only the case for risk reducing, but also for uh, so risk reducing ovarectomy, but probably also for ovarectomy in the context of um, a hysterectomy for a benign indication. Um, and the meta-analysis I uh, refer to uh, in the case of the risk reducing ovarectomy is the one by Kersho et al. I referenced it also in the slide. So if you want to look that one up, you can probably get even more details about this. But yeah, in a nutshell, there does not seem to be a difference depending on the menopausal status of the woman. Um, the only thing I am considering here is that an ovarectomy, at least in terms of a risk-reducing one, is, as far as I know, more prevalent among premenopausal women. But maybe I am wrong with that. Um, when it comes to actually ovarectomies in the case of a benign indication, the likelihood of having an ov ovarectomy increases with age. And I do kind of have my problems with that because I think that if it's not medically required, um, even a postmenopausal woman should not have their ovaries removed. Okay, so one can last... I add a comment? I think, um, thank you, Marlene. I just want to add, I think there's one study uh, by Schiffer, an old study, where they actually looked at uh, young uh, women being of rectomide compared to, to natural postmenopausal and older postmenopausal women being ophrectomized and they found that the women were more distressed about the concession and I think so so maybe the level of loss of desire was um, they, they also lost more desire but the distress level was so high 
And I think it can be explained by many reasons, but one reason is that it's, it's sudden from one day to the other because they are not um, in the menopause and then they grow to be in the menopause and then they are young. So they they're experiencing something else. They come from a well-functioning, maybe sexual desire, sexual life, and then suddenly everything is changed. So I think just the fact that they are also younger and didn't go through the gradual decrease as the yeah. post menopausal. So I think that's, um, Maybe I didn't see the, the beginning of your talk, so maybe you said that. So, um, so that's the only, so the distress is so important that they are more distressed about it. Yeah, th thank you for adding this, Dr. Girardi. This is definitely very important, and again, kind of um, brings us back to what Dr. Broda has said as well, right? Yeah. That we need to consider the context of yeah. the measurements we are yeah. using, and that they might mean different things yeah. in different groups of people, yeah. and also that sexual distress is such an important outcome to add on to sexual function yeah yeah we definitely need to understand sexual distress better as clinicians and also as researchers right i still have one for you marlene i don't know if you can do it briefly because it's you know it's one of those that might take a lot of time anyway i'm just saying i'm texting it to you but i'm reading it to everybody also what kind of a research design would allow separation of the influence of testosterone levels on sexual desire in cis women in POI versus the influence of GSM due to estrogen deprivation. So often pain with sex leads to avoidance in POI or after trans, uh, cancer treatment. If I understand the question correctly, I would rephrase it to some extent, because I think what is being asked here is how we can kind of disentangle the effect of estrogen versus testosterone, mm -hmm. because at least as far as I know from my mostly literature research is that the complaints that are experienced in the context of genital urinary syndrome of menopause are mostly linked to estrogen deprivation. So if we were to make a study in which we... It, which we have already gone through all the ethical considerations, but have a group who is testosterone and estrogen deprived, and we were to randomly allocate these people to hormone replacement therapy plus some form of aromatization um, blocker, we could probably disentangle the differential effects because testosterone is aromatized to estrogen, which in a lot of cases they say is the actual kind of function function going on, like that the aromatization is actually necessary to improve either sexual function or um, genital urinary complaints. Um, but I hope you can follow. Like, so if we can make different groups in which we give this different kind of hormonal therapy plus an aromatization blocker, we could probably disentangle these effects. We would expect, for instance, that in the group in which aromatization from testosterone would still take place or in the group that gets estrogen uh, therapy, the genital urinary problems would improve, but the sexual problems might not, like not the full plethora of sexual problems. Um, whereas in the group that uh, only gets as no. So I, I, I hope I answered the question fully. I don't want to get into more detail, but I think like that kind of setup might get us there. Okay, thank you. You made it quite clear as far as the context allows it. Okay, so I think there's a last one, more global question that it's interesting. And I think it would, even though the person didn't disclose it, I think it would fit Anna Maria who brought so much of the integration of research into clinical practice. So there is this person who says, I've been working with mindfulness for several years now with very good results in most female dysfunctions such as speronia, vaginism and arousal orgasmic disorders. Is there any other type of body-mind therapeutic interventions you, could, you would recommend us to use? Um, and we can add up just, you know, to make it like a wrap it up moment, Anna Maria, how can we use, you know, all this information in clinical settings when we are dealing with people who are mostly asking for help, they are distressed and they are not, they don't have research literacy, media literacy, and sometimes it just get so many things out of media and how can we help people? How can we, you know, translate all this information into a practice? And how can we refer to a best body-mind therapeutic intervention as antidepressants? 
question. Um, oh, oh, thank you. And you say do it short, <laughs> a very big question. Now, I think that, that um, I think um, we use a lot of mindfulness and Laura is really the expert and now she lives. She is the world expert in mindfulness. We use it in our clinic too. But what I think we are missing in mindfulness is that I think that we are observing the body a lot. But what I like about the classical sex therapy is that you actually start behaving with your body. You start doing something with your body. So I would say if you want to take it to another step, I think you should do sensate focus. You can do it with yourself. You can do it with a partner because there you actually start uh, using the body maybe in a different way. And you also need to start thinking about what's happening and how to interpret the sexual responses and stimuli you get. So I, I would say that I would add that. I mean, really the classical sex therapy where, where you start working with your body, do some kind of sensate focus either alone or with a partner. I, I hope that's the, the short question. I, would yeah, I, I think it integrates mindfulness. It's a kind of mindfulness when you do sensate focus, but you do it in a different way. It's a very practical way. You, you actually use your body. You, just, you don't just observe, observe it. Okay, so I think we're pretty to finish now. So I would just add to this, what would Ellen say? And I would add to what Anna Maria has just told, like be aware that you use evidence-based practices in your clinical interventions. And you know, we don't use the one size fits all kind of, we need to let the data speak and research show us what the best interventions are. And I think that's also an important message to, to leave. Um, I want to thank, really everybody was here, the amazing speakers, uh, again and again, Anna Maria. And as I'm stepping out, I would really like to thank Landon Trust and the Education Committee who worked with me. I want to remember you that this webinar actually came from my, an idea of Tally Rosenbaum when she was really enthusiastic how Ellen gave attention to other Practice, practices and to a multidisciplinary work. And she was so enthusiastic how Alan gave, you know, um, visibility to practitioners from physiotherapy and nurses and all the people who are involved in a clinical setting. And that evolved into this having a webinar dedicated to Alan and in what ways Helen is a role model for accurate practice, good research, and you know best um, interventions. So um, there are a lot of people who are great role models out there, of course. Ellen is one of them, and we should honor everybody who deserves their place in clinical and in clinical settings and research. And that's what we try to do here. So I thank you all, and I want to to say it was a pleasure to work with all of you. I don't want to get too emotional, so. Meryl, Marilis, and especially Lillian, who are on the back office, they are never here. They never have their names anywhere. Thank you. So I want to remind you that the, the webinar and the slides will also be made available on demand within the next few days. And um, yeah, now we can see what's coming and I wish the best of luck to the new education committee and let's keep these webinars alive. They are a very democratic a form of education, you know, unpaid and accessible to everyone. Let's make sex research and clinical practice reach everybody in the world. We have language limitation. Let's hope we can have overcome uh, that in future events. Bye. Bye. Thank you.